Today's first reading comes from Genesis chapter 47, verses 1 through 12. So Joseph went and told Pharaoh, My father and my brothers, with their flocks and herds and all that they possess, have come from the land of Canaan. They are now in the land of Goshen. From among his brothers, he took five men and presented them to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to his brothers, what is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds as our ancestors were. They said to Pharaoh, we have come to reside as aliens in the land, for there is no pasture for your servants' flocks because the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now we ask you, let your servants settle in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land. Let them live in the land of Goshen. And if you know that there are capable men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. Then Joseph brought in his father Jacob and presented him before Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, how many are the years of your life? Jacob said to Pharaoh, the years of my earthly sojourn are 130. Few and hard have been the years of my life. They do not compare with the years of the life of my ancestors during their long sojourn. Then Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from the presence of Pharaoh. Joseph settled his father and his brothers and granted them a holding in the land of Egypt, in the best part of the land, in the land of Ramesses, as Pharaoh had instructed. And Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's household with food, according to the number of their dependents. Second reading is from Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 26. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the fifth chapter. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, the disciples came to him. And he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ here at St. Luke's, how truly good it is to be here today. Thank you, Rob, for inviting me to preach 
celebrating both the 25th anniversary of your ordination and to this place that I have great affection for as you celebrate your 100th anniversary year. I was disappointed to have missed the big anniversary weekend last spring as Bob and I had a long planned trip out west. So I'm especially grateful to come and be with you now. I first simply want to acknowledge that many of you were here just 48 hours ago for the funeral of Jim Roberts. I was deeply saddened to hear the news of Jim's passing. He was a wise, or <laughs> a wise and respected leader when I was here serving as your pastor, and I thought very highly of Jim. I remember him as quiet and kind, faithful, someone whose word you could always trust. My sympathies go to Barb and the rest of the family and to all of you who knew and loved him. Let me first say that being here as your pastor from 20, 20, to 2000, I think it was, to 2003 that summer, was a blessing in my life. And you had taken the bold step of calling the first female senior pastor in our Minneapolis area synod. So thank you for breaking that ceiling. My tenure here was not all that long, I realize, but in those few years, we had quite a ride together. I look back on this place with deep gratitude for your trust in me, for what we did together, and for providing such a warm and faith-filled place where our two daughters were able to spend a few of their elementary school years with lots of good memories. When I told them I was preaching here, I said, what are your favorite memories of St. Luke's time? And they talked about sitting here in worship with Smacky. Some of you remember her singing in Pat Lair's kids musicals, participating in Pat Derry's children's ministry and BBS. Those were formative years for our daughters here and for me as a young pastor. I just celebrated last month my 20th anniversary at Westwood in St. Louis Park, where I have served since I left here. And as of last January, my associate of 19 years and I kind of switched places. So he is now the senior pastor, and I get to work uh, two-thirds time for the time being and enjoy being a grandma it still sounds weird to say, <laughs> to one little Catherine, our oldest daughter, Allie. It's her daughter, and Allie now serves as a pastor at Cross of Glory Lutheran Church in Brooklyn Center. And our youngest daughter, Sophie, was married by her sister at Westwood just a few weeks ago. Uh, my husband, Bob, is retired. He's grandparenting and golfing and gardening. So, Let's move on to Rob, and most importantly, to Joseph, our biblical hero that you are remembering here today in this series. Joseph, the Old Testament Joseph. As Rob and I were talking a couple weeks ago, looking back on our years together at Bethlehem in South Minneapolis, where we both served, I remember Rob coming there as a camp counselor turning youth director. And he brought, after many years of changing youth directors, he brought a stability to the program and to our youth. He had a good sense of fun, which was no surprise to you, uh, a practical sense of theology for the youth. He was a hard worker, committed, and eight years later, he was through seminary. And I had the privilege of serving as his internship supervisor when we were both there at Bethlehem. He was ordained there and, as you know, served 26-year tenure between Bethlehem and Spirit Garage, one of Bethlehem's ministries. So congratulations, Rob. As I asked uh, Rob about some of the hurdles and challenges of his ministry, which there weren't that many, <laughs> but he said a line that I remember from back in the days when Saddleback Church in California was a place that had influenced both Rob and myself. Rob said, just as part of conversation that morning, he said, where God guides, you know the line? God provides. 
Where God guides, God provides. Rob, as you know, has an optimistic, not childish, but childlike faith, trusting that that statement is true. Where God guides, God provides. This is where I see Rob's story and Joseph's story intersecting, and perhaps yours as well. But let me take just a minute and summarize the bigger narrative of the Joseph story as Lori read 12 verses of it, but Joseph's story actually runs from chapter 37 in Genesis all the way through chapter 50. Are you glad we didn't read that <laughs> this morning? <laughs> it's the last 13 chapters of the book of Genesis, and it's the longest sustained story in the Old Testament. So this guy is probably worth a few minutes of our time, right? So here's the Cliff Notes version of those 13 chapters. Joseph was the fourth generation of a family that became Israel. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, then Joseph, right? So Abraham was his great-grandpa, and then um, Isaac was his grandpa. Jacob was his father. So this family had grown from, you know, the Abraham and Sarah story, from this old, childless couple, into this huge extended family. And if you read your way through this part of Genesis, you'll see all these crazy stories of this family. Some are bad, some are good. Stories of them securing the land, securing wives. But if that's all we see in this big, long story, we would be missing the main theme, that of promise. That there is a God who loves his people so much that he will stick with them through their unfaithfulness, through their trials and sufferings, through their giving up on him. This God will just keep on being faithful and present to the people that he has chosen. Where God guides, God provides. And this promise comes, as you know, not because they or we have earned it, or because we deserve it, or because we're so obedient. These blessings are simply ours because God is faithful to God's promises. Even this dysfunctional family of Joseph's are bearers of God's promise. Even your dysfunctional family and mine, or whatever our families look or act like, the good news, my friends, is that we too are both recipients and bearers of God's promises. So Joseph is the 11th of 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. And Joseph, as we know, was the famous son. And that part of the story that's most familiar is when his father gave him the Technicolor dream coat, right? But he was kind of obnoxious about this coat and his favored position. He had dreams that he told his brothers about where they were all bowing down to him, which didn't go over very big, as you can imagine. And so his brothers decided to get rid of him by throwing him into a pit. Well, at the last minute, the older brother felt a little guilty about this, and he said, you know, let's just sell him instead. So Joseph was sold, as you know, into slavery and taken to Egypt, where his master's wife down there tries to seduce him. But Joseph did not succumb. Well, she got angry about this, because Joseph was a handsome fellow, I guess, and so she falsely accused him of raping her. And her husband then threw Joseph in jail. Now, I was reading some more about Joseph this week, and it's interesting. A lot of the immigrants with this border crisis in our country, a lot of immigrants have related to this story of Joseph because he was an immigrant in the land of Egypt. Or actually, it wasn't his choice to go there. He was in exile there, right? He was in jail then there for 13 years, innocent the whole time, 
And in jail, his ability to interpret people's dreams became well known. And once he was even invited to go to the Pharaoh's court to interpret one of Pharaoh's dreams. And the Pharaoh was so impressed by Joseph's abilities and personality and integrity that he basically made Joseph CEO of Egypt. There was a famine then that ensued, and Joseph's brothers, ironically, end up making their way down to Egypt, end up in Pharaoh's court, asking their brother Joseph for food. But they didn't recognize Joseph. But Joseph recognized his brothers. And there's this long and fascinating scheme I won't go into that sends the brothers home and then back to Egypt again. And as the story ends, uh, we heard almost the end of the story in the lesson read this morning. In the end, Joseph forgives his brothers for doing what they'd done. They all move down to Egypt with their families and their flocks. They multiply and live out their life in Egypt. Well, this family continues to grow and thrive until a pharaoh, this was generations later, hundreds of years later, this pharaoh had no idea who Joseph and his brothers were. This pharaoh decides to enslave all these immigrants, the Hebrew people. And as you know, they worked for hundreds of years as slaves in Egypt, right? Until along comes another biblical hero. I don't know if you're preaching on Moses. Next week, perfect. Okay, these two stories, I'm just leading you right into it. Along came Moses, and that takes us into the book of Exodus. But what I want to invite you to think about in this Joseph story is that Joseph was a foreigner in this new land, but he had made it big, right? He became a person of prominence and power. And yet his life was full of great suffering. He was abandoned by his brothers. He's thrown into jail down in Egypt and had served as a slave there. And what this story shows us, more than anything else, I think, really, is that God is present in suffering, in the hard times, when we end up in the dark pit. Think of a time in your life, maybe it's recent, maybe it was a while ago, but when you cried out, where are you, God? What are you doing to me? You ever felt that way? I have. Sometimes it's been a time of grief, the loss of my parents, or as both Bob and I have faced cancer. This past week, a young man in my congregation died of a drug overdose. I sat down a couple days ago with his mom, a good friend, and her other son to plan the funeral of this talented young man who simply faced too much of the darkness of this world. Sometimes I have wondered where God was as my friends or congregants struggle through a divorce or financial trials or even the onset of retirement and aging can raise these tough questions, right? We all know that feeling, like Joseph, of being thrown into a dark pit. Now these dark places, I remind you, are not places where God guides. God, that's not the God we believe in, right? Just to teach us a lesson or something. You good Lutherans know that. But this world simply has its failings and its fractures. And it is into this darkness that our God comes. And God does provide. And that provision looks like this. A faithful congregation that has loved and served each other and others for a hundred years. That provision looks like Rob, a faithful pastor for 25 years in the ELCA who has been here for six years and counting. That provision looks like Pat and Tim and Kelly and Deb and Paul and Bill and Lori and Mark and John 
And if you didn't hear your name, speak it now. Because God has provided you to each other, to this congregation, and to our world for such a time as this. This long Joseph narrative has been in the Hebrew Bible from the beginning. I think it was written down so that you and I would hear and know that God is with us too in our suffering, through our hard times, in our dark pits. God did not leave Joseph there, though, and God doesn't leave us either. Thank you to Joseph for this example of trusting God's faithfulness through it all. Thank you to Rob for being one of the people who helps us see and experience God's presence through your ministry. And thanks to our loving God for never, ever letting us go, for providing a hand that guides us and love that supports us as we go. Thanks be to God. Amen.